Also, can the rest of us all stand? And uh, I'm going to invite right now Pastor Philip to come forward. He's going to pray for us as we as we get into the message. Heavenly Father, eternal God, your word is always a light for our way. Today, would you open our eyes and enlighten our spirit that we may understand your truth and all its power and all its holiness. Let us not be hearers only of your word, but doers of your word. So we ask that you give us courage to allow this word to transform our lives and enable us to grow more and more into the image of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. First of all, I would like to say a special thanks to Lonnie for giving me this opportunity it's kind of like an old home week for me. So many familiar faces, and this is kind of my second church, if you will. Uh, I love the opportunity to be here and uh, be with all of you. You're very special in my life, and I thank you. I'm going to read one little scripture before I get started here. This is really the scripture for the day. And then you'll find out why I'm using this particular scripture. This comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. With all prayer and petition... Pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Amen. As we look around these days, Evil, chaos, difficult times surround us. Or as it says in the King James Version, in the book of Second Timothy, chapter 3, verse 1, Know also this, that in the last days perilous times shall come. When we look around us in the news, uh, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I can't watch the news very long before I am overwhelmed with the lunacy, the lying, calling good evil and evil good, and just on and on. And doesn't anybody see this? Can't you see that person is lying? They're not... And why are they doing this? Why are they trying to take us to another direction? We used to have politics where you had an idea of how to get to this point, and I had a different idea, and we might debate or talk about it or vote on it. But now it's my way or the highway, 
and uh, we appear to be hurtling headlong at breakneck speed into the last days of which Jesus in Matthew 24, the prophets, uh, the Apostle Paul, all of them spoke about this time that we're in right now. The enemy, Satan, he's coming at us from every direction with many different weapons, both seen and unseen. How do we fight back? How do we prepare for this? What kind of weapons do we need? The answer is in the 10 verses of the chapter 6 of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Lonnie has been talking about this for the past couple of, uh, more than a couple weeks, almost 10 or each verse taking it a verse at a time. Each of those things is, is oppressing us right now, overwhelming us in some cases. In that letter, some 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote to us kind of a metaphorical picture of using battle armor of a Roman soldier. His description of this ancient armor was very meaningful to his audience because they saw all kinds of Romans all around them, saw that kind of warfare. But it is also very meaningful or just as relevant, if you will, to us today. Paul compares each piece of armor and each weapon with the spiritual principle from God. And God's word never changes. Same yesterday, today, and forever. You might say, how can we arm ourselves in this modern technological age with 2,000 year old armor? Well, our enemy, Satan, he doesn't have much of an imagination. He keeps doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, or working towards a different result. This war is against an unconventional enemy. To succeed against Satan, we must put on the full armor of God. That full armor. Let's look at Ephesians verse six, twelve, chapter 6, verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Then go to verse 13. Therefore, he says, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand, to be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, Stand firm. God's word in Ephesians six ten through 18 tells us there are seven items of armor that must be worn if we are to wage successful warfare. And there are maybe, they are maybe best appreciated if we imagine put these pieces of armor on ourselves with a view of impending mortal hand-to-hand -hand combat. The ancient warfare of Paul's time was singularly horrifying. The experienced soldier knew that he would soon be facing a phalanx of razor-sharp spears, swords, arrows, axes, all jabbing at his vitals, followed to by foot by foot, hand to hand, breath to breath, hacking and stabbing. 
and bloody wrestling set to the terrible music of howls and moans of battle. Kind of like listening to the news today. <laughs> Trembling, he puts on his battle armor, begins to do that. First, he takes this thick leather belt and he straps it around his waist. He straps that belt on his belt girt tight with God's word. His whole person is bound now in truth, the belt of truth. Second, still trembling, he reaches for his metal breastplate, the breastplate of righteousness, shaped to protect the chest and abdomen and vital organs. Note that it was only on the front. He had no armor on the back as a Roman soldier, never backed up. And then in Ephesians 6.15, he says, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Third, he's going to lace up his nail-studded legionnaire boots, if you will. His feet will be secure as he stands his ground and advances in battle. He will not slip. He will not retreat. The boots are his peace with God. Good footwear and healthy feet are essential to a warrior's ability to fight. Can you imagine? They're like football cleats maybe, but these are nails in the bottom of his boots. And he can stand firmly. And they can move forward as a unit, a group of them, and can't be pushed back or easily knocked down. But footwear, uh, harken back to the Vietnam War, the... Uh, platoon leader or gunny or whoever he was, he came around and checked your feet every day. Take off your boots, let me see your feet. Make sure your feet are healthy. If your feet are not healthy, you cannot fight, you cannot march, you can't go to the next battle, you can't climb the hill. You can't do anything if you're blistered. So healthy feet made a big difference. But the spikes in the ground helped him to stand firm. Verse 16 of Ephesians 6. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows from the evil one. After his boots, he picks up this great oblong shell, shield. The shield is about two and a half feet by four and a half feet. Actually some of their shields even had hooks on the sides of them so they could hook it together in a formation and mark and even put shields over the top of their heads because the battle was going to come from every direction and they could advance as a unit like a tank almost, a human tank. Um, that great oblong shield was a piece of solid wood, usually covered with a metal or water-soaked leather. That water-soaked leather helped to extinguish the barrages of flaming arrows, Satan's fiery darts. Satan's fiery darts come to us not as burning arrows and spears or darts, but things in our mind. Some type of addiction, some type of thoughts. He, he sends these flaming darts as, oh, you don't have to do that. You could do this. It's the same thing that he said to Eve. God didn't really say that that way. He didn't mean to make you miserable. You can have a little enjoyment in your life, right? You can be, actually, he just doesn't want you to be like him. 
So those kind of, that's the fiery darts we're talking about. Paul is talking about those fiery darts too, but he's using that metaphor of what the people have seen. I can't imagine that kind of battle with flaming arrows and axes and the sky filled with all kind of weapons firing at you. Then he says, take the helmet of salvation. Helmet of salvation. The helmet protected the forehead, the cheeks. I think we've all seen those with the metal plates down the side, the forehead, and the back of the neck to keep from getting hacked. Uh, it exposed very little but just the eyes, nose, and mouth. But the helmet is the assurance of salvation and it resulting confidence that comes with that. Imagine, put a football helmet on an eight-year-old, and he will swell with confidence and turn into a 60-pound kamikaze, <laughs> at least until he gets knocked down a few times. The helmet enabled the warrior to stand firm where he otherwise would have been long gone in the battle. Consider the helmet of salvation placed on our heads by the nail-pierced hands of Christ at our conversion. This helmet assures us that whatever happens, we are saved. Amen. We are already saved. Saved by grace, Ephesians 2.8. That quote actually came from a book I have with me that I gathered a lot of information about this. By It's a commentary on, on Ephesians by uh, Kent Hughes. But he made this quote, but this helmet placed on our heads by the pierced hands of Christ. The sword of the Spirit. This is the sixth item of armor. Up to this point, all the recommended armor has been defensive. But now the apostle puts forth primarily an offensive weapon, the makaria, the Roman legionnaire's double-edged short sword, was the most effective weapon for close in hand-to-hand -hand combat fighting. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The prayer I said at the beginning, the Word. The Word is what keeps us strong, keeps us together, helps us be, understand and fight back. We have to have weapons to fight back with if we're going to fight Satan's attacks today. But the word of God draws the blood of Satan himself. Arm ourselves with the word of God. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. The word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. 1 John 2, 14. But when... But we must get the word of God into us. For when we are in the heat of battle, we're not going to be able to run to our Bible or our concordance and look up a verse that we can fight back with. It has to already be in us. I say four things are very necessary to prepare for this battle that we're in right now. First, we must read the word. Second, we must take up the sword, that word, by meditating on the word. Third, we memorize the word. And fourth, we stand strong by studying the word, that we might present ourselves approved by God. Reading the word. Second, taking up the sword by meditating. And I don't mean, mm, we meditate, actually the Hebrew word means to ruminate, which means to chew 
on this word. Like a cow chews its cud and swallows it, we digest it and bring it back up and meditate on it some more, over and over again. Read, meditate, memorize, and study. And seventh, now I believe the seventh piece of armor is the very most important piece of all. Prayer. It says in 18, as we read at the beginning, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Some Bibles say supplications, which means humbleness and uh, looking into the Word and praying humbly unto God for our requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the saints. Listen now. Close your eyes and listen. The enemy approaches. A thousand swords ring from their scabbards. In a dreadful symphony of terror, the warrior stands motionless, breathing heavily, hearts pounding. And then the Christian soldier does the most amazing thing. He falls to his knees in deep, profound prayer. To be sure, there will be action. He will rise and his steel will flash, but all will be done in prayer. For prayer is primary. Pray, pray, pray. Prayer is the engine. No, prayer is the fuel. No, prayer is the fuel for the armor. Prayer is the very air we breathe. We cannot continue to exist without air. Without the air and the prayer, we become like a child with asthma who's curled up in the corner gasping for air and we can do nothing to help him. Prayer is essential. It is the very air. We breathe. This picture that is presented to us in Ephesians six eighteen. For after the Christian's warrior's armament is placed, we read again I say, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. This is a spirit-directed prayer that uh, Paul talks about in Romans 8, chapters 26 and 27. He says, in the same way, the spirit also helps our weakness. When we're in an emergency and we don't know how to pray, he says, we don't know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself will intercede for us with groanings too deep for words. I'm not asking you to go out and speak in tongues or do whatever it does for you. Prayer. Turn it over to God. Ask Him in your prayer. He will hear you. Even if you don't know what to say, you say, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say now. Show me. This is not, it is supernatural, but we have to release our hearts and our minds and trust that God will answer you. Verse 27, and he who searches your heart what to, knows what the mind of the Spirit is. And because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God, 
Just ask him. He is that air that you breathe. This is what the apostle wanted us to see by making prayer the seventh item of this armament that we put on. We had all these other physical, but prayer, the seventh piece of armament, and seven is the biblical number of perfection and completion. Seven is a number of design completion. John Bunyan uh, called this weapon all prayer. And I agree. He said prayer is the supreme weapon against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's what we are up against now. We're not up against any particular politician or, uh, yeah, we don't like what they're doing, but this is not coming directly from them. This is coming from these spiritual forces that we do not see. But they're there. That's what we wrestle against. And we can't wrestle against it without the full armor of God. All seven pieces of that armor. The Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, the shoes that have nails on the bottom that we can stand firm and not be pushed backwards. But then the prayer that is the engine for all of that. Finally, let us resolve to arm ourselves for this battle. Let us be strong in the Lord and put on the full armor of God and pray, pray, pray. Amen and amen. I would like you to just think for a moment to yourself how am I going to put this armor what am I going to do read, meditate memorize, study read his word arm yourself but then especially pray pray Pray. I had to do this one time because I know Lonnie goes from side to side here. So, so. Okay, I'll talk to you guys and then I'll come over here and I'll talk to you guys. And that's why I have a cane because I don't want to fall down. I've been falling a lot lately. So I just kind of stand still and hold on to this. But this is uh, such a special opportunity for me. And I want to give you an opportunity today. If you need prayer, come up and get some prayer. If not, if you are interested in joining this church or declaring your, your need for baptism or salvation or whatever it is, Please come forward and talk to myself or Lonnie. We have people here that want to help you make that next step. So if you will please come forward. As our worship team races up to the platform. And <laughs>